Okay, we should be live. Claims that I'm broadcasting. Let me get over away from the computer and we'll get started. Before we get launched, in case you didn't see it, I want to show you that painting that Christina Blackfeather did. That's my English Mastiff Jesse and his cat. I put the uh, link to her Etsy store in the description and her YouTube channel. Go check her out. She does uh, gaming videos, painting videos, you know, the different arts that she does. Knock it off, Milo. The different art that she does. And uh, the camera really doesn't do it justice. The color is a lot more vibrant in person than it shows up on camera. But I really like that. That turned out just fantastic. Let me set this out of the way. I'll have to get that framed pretty soon. I'm going to do a little bit on the history of Pequaware. Favorite Pequaware, made by the favorite stove company of Pequa, Ohio. Now, the favorite stove company was started in 1888 by a fellow named William King Bowl. And Bowl had been a partner in a company called W.C. Davis. And that comes into play a little bit later. Had been a partner in the W.C. Davis company, and they made stoves and cookware and various cast iron products. Most people, even though the company was founded in 1888, they didn't feature hollowware in their catalogs until 1916. And most people kind of assume that's when they started making it, but that's not really true. There's quite a bit of evidence, and this waffle iron here is some of that evidence, that favorite made, whether it was marked or not, made at least some hollowware prior to 1916. This waffle iron, as you can see, says favorite Pequel wear on it. There's also a logo that has an equal sign between the favorite and Pequa. But this is a very old style waffle iron. They made waffle irons in this kind of style since about 1850, 1860 or so. And this is actually identical to a waffle iron that was made by the W.C. Davis Company in the 1860s and 70s. It has the exact same style. The only difference is the lettering on the W.C. Davis waffle irons was raised, and on the uh, favorite waffle irons, it's incused, it's sunken in. And the handle on the base is just a little bit different. The handle on the W.C. Davis bases is a little bit longer. It has a bigger loop in it. But other than that, everything on them is identical. It would have been very simple to grind off the lettering for W.C. Davis and cut in favorite people wear. When the uh, W.C. Davis company reorganized and went bankrupt in the 1880s, it was reorganized into the Western Stove Company, but William King Bull left, and as an owner, he took some of the tooling and apparently some of the patterns with him. Because like I said, this is basically a copy of a W.C. Davis uh, waffle iron. And the 1916 catalog for favorite Picoware doesn't use this style. They use what by then was a more conventional style of waffle iron that had two handles on it. Although Pico wares were a little different, the handles were offset. And instead of being one on top and one on the bottom, the handles were side by side. One of the logos that uh, Pico Ware also used, but only on the waffle irons, was a Sunrise logo. That was the same logo they used on their stoves, but they only used those on waffle irons. Now, most of the logos on, on uh, favorite skillets are listed from 1916 to 1935. They don't really break down what period they were made, and they did change a little bit over the years. They started off with what's called a block logo. Let's see, get the light there. It's simply block lettering, favorite people wear. This is a... Uh, Nice little kettle I got. 
they made the block logo. They also made the block logo with the best to cook in underneath of it. I think these came a little bit after just the plain block logo. Then they started on with a stylized logo. Two different versions of it. This is called a smiley logo because it has that little kind of smiley underneath the uh, name. There's a plain stylized one that doesn't have the smiley logo underneath of it. And these came, I think, a little bit later and uh, lasted up until the end of the company in 1935. Favorite also made an economy brand called Miami Wear. There are some later on that have both favorite wear. Milo, knock it off. That dog's going to drive me nuts. He wants to go outside and play with the cats. They, uh, there are some that have both favorite and Miami logos on them, but those are made in the probably mid-30s when the uh, company had already gone bankrupt and was bought out by Chicago Hardware Founders. And I'll show you some of their stuff. Besides the Miami wear, they also made Puritan brand cookware for Sears Roebuck. Let's see, yeah, you can see it. It says Puritan there. Griswold also made Puritan pans for Sears Roebuck. But they're a little bit different. You can tell them apart. The handles are a bit different. And uh, this, the uh, Griswold made Puritan pans have a three-digit catalog number where the the uh, favorite pans have a size and a mold number. The Griswold pans look a lot like their Iron Mountain range pans. They have an inset heat ring and they also have the italicized uh, catalog number on them. So you can tell them apart pretty easily if you see a, pat, a Puritan skillet whether it was made by favorite or by Griswold. Now in 1935, or about 1933 I think, Stan Holt Bowl died and the company was suffering badly in the Great Depression. They went bankrupt and all the tooling and patterns for their cookware was bought out by the Chicago Hardware Company. There's a few, the uh, dual logoed Miami and favorite skillets are thought to have been made when Chicago Hardware Company had taken over. And they also, that, there it goes, they also made some where they modified the uh, stylized logo, they took away the smiley, and instead of favorite people wear, it said favorite cookware, and then Chicago Hardware Foundry was lettered across the top of the logo and North Chicago, Illinois was lettered below it. Now, Chicago Hardware Foundry is best known for their hammered wear, hammered finished skillets. They made a lot of hammered finished skillets, Dutch ovens. They're really pretty. And most of the skillets, you can spot them because they all have a number eight and then the size number. This one has an eight and part of an eight above it and uh they're pretty tall letters about an inch they're about an inch tall and even like a number five oops, bump my camera a number five scale it would be eight with a five after it kind of hefty little pans and uh they're smooth finished pans that weren't hammered the chicago hardware foundry had a number there. I can see it. They had a number and a diamond for a logo. So that's how you can identify a Chicago hardware Chicago hardware foundry skillet that isn't hammered. And I think that about wraps it up. A little bit of history on them. I put my dog out but I know he's just gonna throw a fit barking at the cats outside so I just have to put up with him. Let me move my camera around and Put my painting away. Get some stuff moved around here. Put that back.
back. Maybe I'll remember to turn off that light this time so there's a blind, I guess. Got to turn off the camera light. I'll go kill that quick. I uh, wonder if Wapak was a competitor. There's, yeah, they were both based in Ohio, and uh, there are quite a few. And they were in business at pretty much the same time, so I'm sure there would have been competition between them. Yeah, Chicago Hardware, they're having a big labor dispute. And, uh, they're pretty much going under anyway, so that finally killed them off. Uh, something I wanted to show you. I got this off of eBay. That's a reprint of the 1895 Majestic Range catalog and cookbook. And I was flipping through some of these old recipes in here. And uh, I will definitely be making some recipes out of this on the cook stove. When it's winter again, they'll give you something to look forward coming up once it gets turns cold again. It's getting a little bit too warm to run the wood stove. So it's going to be pretty well done with that for the summer. But one recipe in here I really like. It sounds really good. Beef a la mode. In a piece of rump, put deep openings with a sharp knife. Put pieces of pork cut into dice, previously rolled in pepper, salt, cloves, and nutmeg. Onto an iron stew pan, lay pieces of pork, sliced onion, slices of lemon, one or two carrots, and a bay leaf. Lay the meat on and put the cover on. Wait a minute here. Skipped line. And put it over and put over it a piece of bread crust as large as the hand, a half pint of white of wine, and a little vinegar. Kind of hard type to read, especially now that it's dark in here. And afterwards, an equal quantity of water or broth till the meat is half covered. Cover the dish close, then cook until tender. Then take it out, rub the gravy thoroughly through a sieve, skim off the fat, add some sour cream, return to the stew pan, and cook 10 minutes on a majestic range. Instead of the cream, capers or sliced cucumber pickles may be added to the gravy if preferred, or a handful of grated gingerbread or rye bread. The meat can also be laid for some days before in a spiced vinegar or wine pickle. Sounds kind of like a sauerbraten type of recipe. And uh, I've made sauerbraten before. And, uh, but I want to try that. This sounds like it would be really fun, you know, sticking pieces of, you know, for the fat, more or less, into uh, a big beef roast and roasting her up. Hey, Grampy Lobster's here. Faith Sykes. Hi, Faith. I love gravy. I bet you do. Uh, did you did you see that sour broughton video that I did, Grampy? Got my camera at a funny angle. I'm always looking away from it there. That's a little better. Yeah, the uh, those old recipes. You know, there's a lot of the uh, recipes in there. You'll use half a teacup full, half a dessert a dessert spoonful. Things like that, they're not real specific, and they kind of assume you know how to cook. So, uh, you know, it'll be fun playing around with some of them old recipes. Yeah, I really like that hammer finish stuff. You know, I've tried to find as much as I can, but I haven't really found a whole lot. I just got a couple of, I got an aluminum rounder somewhere, aluminum Wagnerware 
Dutch oven that's hammered. But it's pretty rough. It's going to need a lot of polishing and cleaning to get it, get it looking decent again. Let's see. Make sure I'm all the way back through my comments. Anyway, uh, yeah, I've been pretty busy today. I'm kind of tired right now. I've been outside doing some deforesting. They got a area up by my garden that's gotten overgrown with popple trees and popple slashing. So I've been hacking and slashing and digging out stumps and dragging brush all day. So I think they could find it. Uh, I'll have a little remedy for that from Yukon Jack. That always brings back memories of high school. So, ooh, $9.99 from Faith Sykes. Thank you much, Faith. Enjoy your watching your videos and learning more about cast iron. Yeah, and uh, no, it's finally starting to turn decent outside. I got a whole bunch of stuff planned that hopefully I'll be able to get to over get to all of it over the summer. I'm gonna redo my uh, electrolysis tank, make a bigger one because that's kind of a bottleneck for my restoration. I can strip a ton of stuff at a time with a lie tank. But my uh, electrolysis, I can only run one piece at a time through it. And uh, if you strip it first with lye or oven cleaner or whatever, get it stripped off, it goes a lot faster if you're just using the electrolysis to get the rust off. You know, it usually only takes about uh, 10 or 12 hours or so when it gets it right down clean. Where if you're doing both stripping it and getting the rust off, you know, it can take a couple of days in electrolysis. So... Hopefully I'll get that set up and uh, I'm going to do some welding, you know, show how to uh, weld cast iron, welding and brazing it. This thing always pops up in the middle of the stream, my computer giving me a hard time. Uh, do some, you know, do some repair in cast iron because, uh, you know, somebody gets into doing, you know, restoring a cook stove like that. You're probably going to have to do some sort of welding or brazing on it at some point. Because uh, you can find parts for them around, but you're not necessarily going to find them in any kind of useful amount of time. You might have to fix up and make do what you got or build something entirely from scratch because you can't find the parts at all. Uh, how many amps am I running? I got a big, uh, a big wheel charger that I use for starting my tractor in the winter and it's uh puts out 40 amps full time you know you can boost it up to uh I think it puts out 200 for you know starting and boosting but you can't run that all the time it's uh it'll kick out after a couple of minutes but it'll put out 40 amps steady and I should be able to run you know two or three things at a time with that much power because uh you really only need about 10 amps. That usually works pretty good for most stuff. And, uh, you know, a small regular charger will put out will put out 10 amps. So, uh, scary woodland creatures walking behind me. I know. He's lurking about. Finally got him settled down. He's been just a pain in the ass the last hour or so. Uh, so long the soak you mean in the uh, electrolysis if you don't strip them first if they got a real heavy buildup you know it'll take you know at least a day sometimes to to uh get everything peeled off and get all the rust off but it works uh but if you strip them with lye first and then soak them you can you know anywhere from five to six eight hours sometimes is all it takes then so I can get two or three pans done a day, but I can only do them one at a time. Oh, hi, Anna. It's good to see you. Anyway, uh, 
yeah. So once I get that, I'll be doing videos on on uh, making, you know, setting out the electrolysis tank, and then I'll have two of them because I can still use. I still have a smaller charger that I can run that smaller tank. Uh, how much you know? Yeah, I, yeah. It's you know, stuff is kind of spreading around a little bit more different makers, but there's still you still don't see a lot of you know southern mystery skillets. And things like that around here. <laughs> oh, Grampy, you're welcome to stop by. You don't ruin things, even if you are a bit of a loose cannon at times. Yeah, you can get a DC transformer, but, you know, it's... A little bit spend to give you three leads at 40 amps what would be ideal would be a uh, electroplating power supply because you can adjust them and they uh you know put out massive amounts of current and then you can run all kinds of stuff if you have a big enough tank to hold everything it's not really the voltage that you need either the uh when i was working at Cray Research doing copper plating. It was only a six volt system, but it would put out. Aren't the old cannons cast iron too? Uh, no, they were mostly wrought iron. The old uh, cannon, wrought iron. The really old ones were bronze before they started making a lot of iron. But uh, wrought iron is a little bit stronger. It can uh, stretch more than cast, even though it's cast. You know, it's poured in a mold and then machined out at uh, a little bit different composition than than uh, gray cast iron likes to use for most things. And a cannon would be fun to have. It's legal to own a cannon because uh, as long as it doesn't fire explosive shells, you can own cannon and even some uh, small artillery guns, up to like, you know, 50 millimeter artillery guns, as long as they fire a solid shot and not an explosive shell. I shudder to think what you would pay for one of those, but that would be kind of a fun thing to have every now and then. But a cannon would be just a riot to have. I mean, I'd love to have one make clearing trees a whole lot easier and a lot more entertaining. Hey, Polly. Oh, I got 34 people watching. Wow. I uh, stopped at a preview for an upcoming estate sale. Uh, what were you looking to get? Yeah, see, there's they're uh, starting to get a few more cast iron things in the uh, second hand shops. It's usually pretty dry over the winter, but come spring, people start spring cleaning, and well, grandma may not have made it through the winter. And uh, you know, you start seeing a lot more stuff in second hand shops, and the uh, the Catholic Church over in town, they've got a big thrift sale they run couple of days a week and they're going to have their first one tomorrow so I'm going to go check that out I've got a few nice things there uh, how am I able to hang the pans on the wall uh, because the one wall over here when I uh, sheeted it up I planned on putting stuff there you know hanging pans and whatnot so that has a sheet of three-quarter inch plywood behind the siding and this one over here is actually used to be the outside wall of the house and uh that was sheeted up with one inch boards years ago so it's a solid wood wall all i gotta do is poke a screw in it but uh mostly for hanging walls you're gonna need a rack of some sort or a board with hooks on it and you'll have to screw that into the stud and be sure to use long enough screws you know that'll go at least at least two inches into a two by four Three is better, plus the thickness of whatever drywall you have and the thickness of the board that you're mounting to the wall. 
you can get freestanding racks too, pretty cheap. You know, they work good. You can see here. You can see that one there. That's actually a, it's like a six foot tall rack, but I just used, a, you know, didn't run it all the way up the ceiling. I just, you can set it up so it staggers over and make two short shelves out of it instead of a big one. Uh, 1857 six pounder yeah I smell of gunpowder yeah you shoot muzzle loader a fair bit and uh the black powder revolver I got that's always that's a blast to shoot you know for a 44 caliber black powder has a lot different feel to the recoil of it a 44 mag has got a hell of a kick to it but a 44 black powder you know is real easy real light kick into it Well, the ones that are hanging on the wall are hanging on the wall, but I got, you know, shelves there that I can pile stuff on that I'm working on. You know, but yeah, you know, the ones that are on the wall, those are, those are just put a, uh, I just put a brass screw right in the wall because it's solid wood. You know, but they're, most of them are a bit too heavy to go and try and hang them on a sheetrock wall. You know, if they, uh, you know, like a little sheetrock, plastic sheetrock anchor, it just won't hold it. You've got to have, you know, something screwed into the studs that you work off from there. Uh, machine cast, stove cast, boiler air, cookware cast, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of cast iron. There's, you know, ductile iron, which is basically cast, but it can stretch and bend a little bit. Malleable iron, uh, gray iron. Gray iron is what uh, most cookware is made out of. Uh, no, that's a, uh, that's an acrylic. And she glazed it over with a uh, matte glaze. Like I say, the camera doesn't really do it justice. The color is a lot more vibrant on that and I'll have to get that painted get it framed rather pretty soon and uh, hopefully you'll go check out Christina's her Etsy store and uh, her YouTube channel yeah I'm just tickled with that it, uh, it really turned out nice you know, and she did some videos as she was painting along on it. And uh, she did it from a picture that I had of him. And the way he, we couldn't quite figure out how his front feet were twisted around. Because you can just kind of tell in the picture. But it looks like he's got his feet kind of wrapped around each other. And then both of them shoved off to one side. And we couldn't quite figure out how in the hell he did that to begin with. Much less how to paint it, so kind of uh just had to kind of punt on the one side and make it look like it is in the picture but even in the picture you can't tell just what the hell he's doing with himself how he got himself pretzel drawn like that <coughs> yeah a cannon would be just be just too much fun and a gatling gun because those are legal too they're uh Consider it a semi-automatic as long as you don't, you know, go nuts and try to put an electric motor on them. But they're considered a semi-auto as long as they're hand-cranked, so they're legal to own, too. Uh, welding and fixing. Most times you don't need to fix a crack unless it's across the bottom. You know, if it's just cracked up the side, you can get away with cooking with them for quite a while. But there's always a risk that the crack will run. But as far as being worthwhile, it really depends. If you have to pay somebody to do it, it's going to cost quite a bit. I mean, a welding shop, you're looking anywhere from 80 to 150 bucks an hour for their shop time. And uh, as far as collector value goes, you know, it won't have any real value. I mean, 
be worth maybe 20 bucks. But if you have something that has a lot of sentimental value, your idiot nephew dropped your great great grandmother's pants, snapped the handle off it, you know, it could be worthwhile to repair it for that reason. Because most collectors would rather have a pan that's cracked and nothing's been done to it than uh, one that's cracked and been repaired. Even if you do a good job on it, it still lowers the value enough to where what you could sell it for is going to be less than what it costs to fix it. How do I take care of wood cook stove tools like uh, old sad irons? Chicken shaped trivet for humidity and plate lifters and cast trivets. A lot of the stuff, you know, that isn't really on the stove all the time, like, you know, your uh, your lid lifter, trivets and things like that, as long as you're not going to be in food contact with them, you can just uh, paint them with a uh, high temperature stove paint. You know, wire brush them up good, get the rust off, get them cleaned up and uh, and just paint them. Uh, old clothes irons. You know, this could be a bit tricky because to actually use them, if you want to use them, use them, you would need to polish the bottom real good. You'd have to grind it smooth and it, it takes a bit of doing. But something like that, too, you can just uh, season that like you would a skillet and uh, that would prevent it from rusting for the, uh, you know, the irons. The humidity, you know, you're Things like that is really tough because you're going to get so much uh, deposits from your water. The minerals in your water are always going to be left behind when the water boils off. So those are pretty tough to uh, pretty tough to keep them looking nice. You know, you can paint the outside of them because they don't usually get that hot. That's going to be a problem. Or uh, you, know, you can season them up good like you would anything else. And that does help quite a bit. you got to... Keep at them though, you gotta wipe the outsides down with you know, a little oil every now and then. You know, but the inside there's not really much you can do to prevent it because it's gonna build up from whatever's in your water. So that's how you take care of some of the odds and ends. You know, if you want to use a clothes iron, yeah, you'd have to, uh, you know, sand it down and keep sanding it until you get a good, you know, get a good smooth polished, polished bottom on it. Yeah, the favorite city. Yeah, like I say, they're, uh, you know, from an economic point of view, it's not really, yeah, you can hear them outside, can't you? Yeah, spring peepers. Uh, talking about Pequot, Ohio, yeah, it was uh, the favorite stove company from Pequot, Ohio. Yes, Brenda, you missed everything good. You missed the bestest part. <laughs> I did a little bit on the uh, history of favorite people wear. Hi, Billy Lee. Good to see you. Oh, let's see, where was I? I'm always losing my place here. I'm easily, easily distracted right now. I'm tired. Like I said, I've been slaving away. Yeah, Sydney made cast iron. Uh, Wapak was in uh, Wapakoneta, Ohio. You know, right dead center of the heart of the Rust Belt.
wish you could show some of my collection. Uh, if we got a camera, you know, a uh, webcam, I could put the link out there and you could come on in and show some of your stuff. If you were mine too. Uh, do I do any fish or wild game cooking? Yeah, some. Whenever I have fish or wild game around. Or my irritating little dog. Yeah, he's probably going to settle down. I shouldn't get be too hard on him. He's been a real pain the last couple of hours. You know, I was wanting in and out and throwing a fit, barking the cats on the porch. And I really don't need the noise. But yeah, I was hoping to get some suckers. I was gonna, went sucker fishing a couple of times, but didn't get anything. I think I missed sucker run because we had a big warm spell in March. And I think they ran earlier than they usually do. So, uh, but I was hoping to make some pickled fish and uh, some fried fish eggs. Because that's a real, really good recipe. I never, Milo, knock it off. Let's see, we're over there. For some reason, you guys have so much cast iron up north. Yeah, a lot of you know, a lot of the production was in uh, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and uh. You know, got shipped around the Great Lakes area real easy, so it, uh, you know, kind of stayed up north, but, but, uh, Lodge and Birmingham Sullivan Range are southern companies, you know, so that's mostly what you're going to find in the south. Never found a piece for $10. Yeah, they're getting hard. You can still find some pretty nice stuff, you know, in secondhand shops or thrift sales. It's you know, matter of patience, you can find some pretty cool stuff for 10, 20 bucks. Yeah, notifications are terrible anyway. If you set a reminder, if somebody has a live stream coming up or a premiere, it never fails. YouTube will tell you 10, 15 minutes after they start. And if they you know, only premiered a 10 minute video, well, it's kind of pointless. You already missed the whole thing. Yeah, there are a lot of foundries foundries around and uh you know pretty much all the smaller ones have died off there's still a couple of big ones in wisconsin but they meant they uh doing cast iron but it's not cookware it's mostly uh manhole covers grates things like that manhole castings oh guess like spoon machine pans easy to replicate nowadays yeah you can still machine them you know it's not a matter of not being able to do it it's just a uh it's another step in the in the manufacturing process and it costs money to do it you have to have the machinery and the people to run the machinery so uh that's why most makers have gotten away from it because it cuts the costs way back ah smelt from port wing yeah smelt are good they're pain to clean. You know, I mean, if you got a five gallon bucket full of smelt and you got to clean all them wretched little things, you're going to be there forever. <laughs> yeah, a lot, most of the iron ore came down out of Minnesota through the Great Lakes. Oh, uh, what most I ever paid, what, what was the most I ever paid? The most I paid, I think, was around a hundred bucks for, uh, I got a big, a great big gate marked Marietta pan. I got it out in the uh, electrolysis tank right now. But most of my stuff I pay, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 bucks for. <laughs> Manhole covers made in India. Yeah, you gotta wonder how in the hell can they afford, how can they make any money casting something in India and shipping it all that way? You know, especially a big, heavy, bulky thing like a manhole casting. But well, they managed to do it somehow. Most of, around, most of the, uh, most of the uh, manhole casting and such around here are made in Nina, Wisconsin, by the Nina Foundry. Crazy. 
Great for old cast iron. 17 various pieces, 15 bucks. Yeah. That's all kinds of good. Uh, thoughts on cat sandblast and cast iron? You really shouldn't do it because, uh, you know, first of all, you don't want it because it's going to abrade the metal. And if you have lettering and logos in there, it's going to really, really wipe that out fast and it gets blurry. You don't want to do anything that's going to remove metal except as a very last resort. And uh, I haven't tried, you know, things like soda blasting that's supposed to be non abrasive. But something that uh, all forms of blasting will do is it produces heat. It makes a lot of friction when whatever your blasting media is hits the metal you're blasting. And you can get hot spots and you, it's possible to crack and warp things like that. So uh, that's why you can't really blast sheet metal very well. It's really tricky. It's possible. But a lot of times you try and blast, a, you know, sandblast a car or something. It's going to make the metal warp and buckle. But, you know, in general, you shouldn't do it. Yeah, they break up ships in India. Uh, India and Bangladesh. Turkey, too. Is, they, break, they break up a lot of ships. I guess a lot of the cruise ships, they decided they're just going to scrap them out. You know, they got the few biggest, newest ones, but pretty much everything else with the coronavirus going around pretty much put the kibosh on the cruise industry. So anything that's less than a couple of years old, they just had to hell with it and scrap them out. Sent them to be broke up. You just got to be a pain, don't you, Milo? Yeah, that dog. <laughs> Harbor Freight. Yeah. I see there's a uh, channel on here. The guy does kind of an ASMR restoration thing. He pretty much sandblasts everything. And he did a couple of, he did a waffle iron and a skillet. And yeah, it's just about everything wrong you could possibly do to it. It was a Wagner 1891 skillet. You know, so it wasn't a hugely valuable pan. He sandblasted the hell out of it. And he had to go back and he recut the lettering on it because he had had uh, blurred out that lettering so bad sandblasting it. The new electrolysis method. Yeah, okay, I'll get on that. Uh, but that, oh yeah, I was going to uh, because uh, manual battery chargers are tougher to find nowadays, I was going to uh, experiment with setting it up, running it off a battery, and using an automatic charger to charge the battery as you go. You know, basically so that the battery acts as a load on the charger to keep the, uh, you know, so the charger is actually putting out power and charging up the battery, and the battery itself is supplying the power for the electrolysis. But I gotta pick up a, uh, gotta find a cheap little automatic battery charger. Number 10 vintage Wagner came out new and seasoned beautifully. I was impressed. Yeah, I mean, it's surprising sometimes how nice things will come out. You know, I mean, I've had some really nasty, really nasty, badly rusted stuff that uh, just came out beautiful. After you use it a couple times, you can already tell that it was ever anything but brand new almost <laughs> Milo get over here I'm sick of listening to you come here come here you ignore me ain't you <sighs> Oh, I know he won sandblast or cast iron. But yeah, I'll be setting up the uh, the new tank pretty soon, so I'll run that through. Yeah, the uh, 1891 Wagners, they're not bad pans. I mean, most of them are perfectly fine for, you know, whatever use you want to use them for. It's just a lot of people think, 
it actually is from 1891. And uh, it's hard to convince them that they're actually made in the 1990s, even though it says Centennial Edition on most of them, or all of them, I think. You know, they're a little heavy and they some of them are kind of rough, but, you know, most of them, you know, they work just fine. Yeah, well, actually, that's the, uh, there's a bell on the door that he rings when he wants out. He wants to go out and chase cats around is what he wants to do. And then they have to listen to him barking and yapping and raising hell with cats. Yeah, yours is right. Yeah, they didn't, uh, most new cast iron, they don't machine the insides of it. So, uh, you know, there are some that still do. They're kind of, you know, boutique makers. They're real nice pans, but uh, they're pretty expensive. Something like that, you can get away with sanding it without causing too much problems because uh, you're not going to damage the value on something like that. And uh, use an orbital sander and like a 50 grit sanding wheel. I got to put him up just to shut him up, either that or skin him alive. Anyway, you can use an, uh, use an orbital sander and uh, a 50 grit sanding pad. In about 15 minutes, it'll smooth it up plenty good enough. You don't have to get every pit out of it, you don't need to get a mirror finish or anything like that. And uh, then reseason it and you're good to go. You know, if it's an older pan, a vintage pan, you know, sanding is really a last resort because most of them are smooth to begin with. There's no need to. And you don't really need to remove pitting most of the time because it doesn't uh, doesn't cause any problems. Once in a great while, I'll come across something that has some real fine pitting and it's almost like Velcro. And uh, you just have to knock enough of the high spots off of that to uh, keep stuff from sticking. But if you want to smooth up a newer pan, yeah, go ahead. And uh, I got a video on here where I showed how to do that. It's on my channel somewhere. You gonna settle down now? Where'd my drink go? There it is. Oh yeah, if I wasn't doing anything, I could sit here and stare at the ceiling all day and you won't hear a peep out of that dog, but as soon as I start to make a video or do a live stream, he's right underfoot and making all kinds of racket. Yeah, Milo needs some love. He needs a good swift kick sometimes, I think. But I wanted to actually do that. Oh yeah, and he just loves having them cats out of the forest. I got feral cats that live outside. They're great for keeping the mice down, but they just drive him nuts. He doesn't know which one to chase. Use 50 grit. Yeah, you don't need a. You don't need to get a real smooth, polished, polished finish on the cast iron if you're going to sand it, and. uh 50 grit work good and fast and it's plenty smooth and you don't want to use something that's really going to burnish the surface you know really get a fine polish because it makes it uh makes it harder to season you know if you just go over for about you know about 10 15 minutes with a uh with a uh random orbital sander it knocks it right down yeah, I did. Yeah, I did a video on that. I took a new lodge pan, you know, and just sanded the bottom out of it. You can sand it longer, but after, you know, about 15, 20 minutes, it gets to be kind of a point of mission return because you want to try and get every little single dimple and pit out of it. You'd have to take off so much more wood, or so much more wood. That's all wood burning stove. You'd have to take so much more iron off it just to get those little tiny imperfections out of there you know most of what uh most of the benefits gonna come fairly quick what's i drinking that is yukon jack oh. 
fine stuff that is. Uh, looking at a wood burning stove, but the flue is in bad shape. Burned almost to the back of the stove. Is there such a thing as coupling to make it workable? Uh, what kind of stove is it? Is it a cook stove like that, or more like a heater stove? Yeah, you know, because if it's a uh, if it's a cook stove. You can uh, you can build a new with this. It's got the uh, well, it's got a smoke passage on the back of the stove. It's a separate piece, and uh, where the slider works, you know the stove pipe comes down. There's a collar, and that's your flue. You can either divert the uh, divert the heat out through the stove pipe, or all the way around the stove, all the way around the oven box, and then back up a box on the back. Is that what you're talking about for the flu? Yeah, because if it is, you can uh, you can make something like that out of stainless steel easily enough. It's not a on most stoves anyway. It's not a huge problem, but yeah, it worked out. Uh, the videos on my channel is fairly recent not too long ago and uh you know i kind of go through there and you'll see how it turns out you know i mean it looks it actually looks a lot you know more shiny and mirror like than it is because it's just you know brand new and smooth but it's you know it's a lot smoother but still got some dips and dimples and little bits of pits and pitting in it and it's just not worth the effort that it would take to get them out Yeah, three 12 inch lodges. Yeah, give it a try and log them and see what you think. Uh, yeah, you know, this was a, it was a newer pan, and uh, I got it in a box of junk with other stuff. You know, a whole bunch of pans at one time, and it was a brand new, brand new lodge pan, and I didn't uh, even bother stripping the factor seasoning off, I just sanded it right down. Yeah, we're getting close to an hour, so I usually try to keep these to an hour. So I'll probably wrap her up here in a couple of minutes. So if you have any final questions, anything else you wanted to know, they were counting. You know, I haven't actually counted up all the bits and pieces of cast iron I got. Guardianware? I've never heard of that. Is that like aluminum cookware or cast iron? Yeah, maybe one of these days I will have to count up and see how many I've actually got. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I never heard of, never heard of Guardianware. <laughs> aluminum. Oh yeah. Yeah, I got a couple of aluminum bits and pieces. I got. I mentioned before. I got that hammered. Uh, Wagner aluminum Dutch oven, but uh, pretty much everybody made aluminum at one time or another too, along with cast iron. Yeah, write down a few questions for next time. Yeah, you know, I should probably try and get a little better organized topic too, so I can fill the time a little better and 
hold on to the audience more. Then I've had more of an audience watching, and I'd have more questions, and I could answer more questions, and it filled the time easier. It's kind of a vicious cycle that way. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, I think we'll call her a day here, and uh, we'll be back next week with something else. If you're watching and you haven't joined or subscribed, please do so. You don't have to, but I certainly appreciate it. And uh, give Christina Blackfeather a you know check out her uh, her Etsy page and her YouTube channel. And uh, she's just an all around wonderful person. So give her a little bit of love and attention. And I'll see you all later. I'll be back next week. Hopefully, I'll have a video up this weekend, depending on. All, all my other chores are on the house go but uh i've been doing a little pie experiment that's going pretty good so far and uh if it turns out the way i want to i'll actually film it anyhow i'll see you all next week and enjoy yourselves in the meantime